So hello, welcome to all to this uh, 17th, uh, we call it a lecture, but actually today it's not a lecture, but it's a lecture series. Um, and this is number 17 of the, the ones in Roskvit uh, lecture series that started last year. Um, this one is a very special one. It is the first one in a series uh, of, uh, we don't know how many yet, uh, but it will last as long as the project lasts. And the project is Your Herit. Uh, very important topic, we think, and a, a very important uh, project with um, a large scope of, of participants and partners in this project uh that will last for for over two years so we will come back with uh details about the project and outcomes and results of the project when they are due when they are there uh, we will schedule another series and and another program uh or or lecture evening to uh to discuss that with you and to um bring it to an audience or to uh, bring it into a discussion to a to a public debate um tonight indeed is a kind of very first uh you could call it a foundational uh gathering which is much more about the concepts behind the project why we think it's important why the project exists in the first place and how it can be framed and why it could be important we hope for ukraine and how uh, we can use it uh, and and people active in the field can can use the program later on we hope that it can bring some examples some pilots uh, and open some debates maybe that last part is even the most important one um i will not uh, talk much longer but give the floor to uh, tatiana olinik who is the the program leader from Rosfit uh, and also uh, knowledgeable in the field. So she will introduce our speakers. Um, I've got to tell one extremely practical thing, and that is the language thing. Uh, you are listening now to me, maybe in English, but you have a tool uh, underneath in your screen, which is uh, a possibility to choose your language. So if you want uh, to follow the language, the, uh, the evening in Ukrainian, then please the Ukrainian language and otherwise choose the English language. Everything will directly translate it. Um, and at the same time, you can also, if you ask some questions, you can put them in Ukrainian or you can put them in Eng English, whatever you feel the most comfortable uh, to deal with. So, Without much further ado, I give the floor to Tatiana, please. Thank you very much, Lilette. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, so, today we are joined by uh, Katerina Goncharova, uh, previously served as a head of the research department at the Ukrainian State Research and Project Institute for Historic Preservation. She is a crisis manager. Uh, she has been involved with the preservation of architectural heritage and historical sites of Ukraine, including research, management, and scientific support of the projects. She was a Fulbright scholar, uh, and she conducted research concerning the U.S. experience in historic preservation of public-private um, uh, partnership. And she also was a co-organizer of various urban development, civic participation, and other projects as a resource for strategic development. She has a, a, a degree in museum and monument studies. And our next participa, a participant is uh, Ruth Schagemann, is an architect who studied architecture at the University of Braunschweig. She is the president uh, of the uh, uh, Council of Architects of Europe. Uh, before that, for five years, uh, she was a participant of the uh, Architects Council of Europe and uh, also the coordinator of the European Network of Architects Competent Authorities. Uh, since um, 
And she is also, uh, rep she's representing AC in uh, 2023, the Voz Baukultur Alliance Steering Committee. So in the project Yuri Harit, she represents the Council of Architects of Europe and the Federal Chamber of uh, Architects of Germany. And uh, I would like also to introduce our key speaker today, uh, Ruta Leitenaite, uh, an architect, architecture curator, critic, publicist, writer, and lecturer. She was a representative uh, a president of the Architects Association of Lithuania, and uh, now she is on the uh, board. Uh, uh, Ruth is head of the Solidarity with Ukraine group, and uh, she also is an expert in the Safeguarding Heritage in Ukraine group. And um, she is also head um, of the Department uh, of the Ministry of Culture of Lithuania. She is uh, the coordinator of the Yuri Harit uh, Creative Europe project. And I give the floor to her to introduce this project. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you to everyone. And I'm really grateful that uh, we have this chance to present our project to a very highly professional, I would say, audience of uh, Roscoe Network. So I'm very happy and I'm really hopeful that after this conversation, we will get even more followers and also participants in our project. So I will start uh, would, I wouldn't say this as a key lecture, as it, I hope that I will take not more than 10 minutes to present the project. It's just a very short information on what is this project and uh, what we will be doing in upcoming two years and a half. So uh, it all started one year ago when the program Creative Europe uh, issued a new call, very specific call with the name support to Ukrainian displaced people and the Ukrainian cultural and creative sectors. So while reading the, uh, the requirements of that call, uh, we saw that proposals should have included activities directly targeting both of the following objectives, which are to prepare the post-war recovery of the Ukrainian cultural sectors through needs assessments, capacity building and investment planning, and additionally, to prepare and train Ukrainian cultural heritage professionals with regard to the protection of Ukrainian cultural heritage from risks. So when seeing this, uh, I thought immediately that this is a project, this is a call for architects because it's about architecture, it's about cultural heritage. And we, uh, if we want to take any action uh, as the Architectural Society of Europe, we should apply for this call. And we did. We wrote an application, uh, Yuri Herit. This is the short name, but the, the full name is Architects for Heritage in Ukraine, Recreating Identity and Memory. So officially the applicant and coordinator is my organization, which is Architects Association of Lithuania. And me, myself, I am the coordinator of this project. So some of statistics, the project is lasting 36 months. It makes three years. Uh, Creative Europe program uh, will give us 1 million euro uh, that is covering 90% of all the project. And now we are getting to the most interesting parts, which is the content and the participants. So uh, as I said, we were thinking about European architectural community joining the forces. Therefore, we had to have quite um, a reasonable number of participants and we have 12 participants of this project in the shape of organizations, and all of them are architectural organizations. So from uh, European side, we have Architects Association of Lithuania, we have Architects Association from Sweden, we have Federal Chamber of Architects and Chartered Engineers of Austria, we have Royal Danish Academy, the Institute of Technology and Architecture, we have Architects Chamber of Romania, also we have I will just be short, Architects Chamber from Italy, Architects Chamber of Germany, Estonian Association of Architects, and as the associated partner, we have Architects Council of Europe. And also from Ukraine, we have three very relevant organizations, the National Union of Architects of Ukraine, Roskvit, 
and Kharkiv School of Architecture. So we are covering uh, almost all the fields. We are covering practitioners of architecture. We are covering academia and also NGOs. What is the idea of the project? So uh, we, with this project, we are addressing the topics of evaluation, preservation, and restoration of the urban and architectural heritage in Ukraine during and after the war treating the heritage as a resource for sustainable cultural, social, environmental, and economic recovery, while solving challenges of preservation, redefinition, and highlighting the national and local cultural identity and reflect the memory in the rebuilding. So during the project, interdisciplinary teams of Ukrainian and European heritage specialists, architects, planners, engineers, other professionals, officers of local authorities and communities of Ukrainian cities, in various forms, professional workshops, seminars, public events, research, etc., will share their knowledge and experience and will experiment with the aim to build competence on the heritage protection, regeneration of culturally meaningful plans and projects, and empowering of local communities as a tool for building the new, democratic and sustainable Ukraine with a unique yet European cultural DNA. So the project is soft. We are not building anything. We are learning from each other. The objectives of the project, of course, is to recover the cultural sector of architecture, in our case, as a blossoming field of action, engaging in combining tangible and intangible heritage with new architecture and urban design. The specific long-term objectives of the project is to build capacity to recover war-damaged immovable heritage of Ukraine as a part of a general reconstruction effort, to reconstruct social and identity structures starting from the cultural heritage recovery, to activate and involve local communities in all phases of the recovery, and to activate and generate local economic networks and processes. So the ambition is there and it's big. With this project, we want to contribute to the recovery of architectural sector, inviting Ukrainian architects to collaborate with European architects on an equal footing, which is very important, to share knowledge and experience and together search for Ukraine suited methodology and ways to preserve and recover Ukrainian urban and architectural heritage in a sustainable and inclusive manner. This project was written basing on the values of Architects Council policy for solidarity with Ukraine. And those values mainly are co-creation of unique and Ukraine tailored solutions. We don't believe that something that was created and was successful in Europe just could be copied and pasted in Ukraine because every site, location and community have their own history and context. So every solution should be unique. The activities of the project will take place in different Ukrainian cities and EU countries. So proportion is about 50 and 50%. We will have workshops in Ukraine as well as in Sweden or in Austria, for example. We hope that this project, besides the deliverables that I will name later, will work as a platform of European and Ukrainian architects collaboration. And as we had our first conference in Lviv, I saw that those things were already starting to happen. And last but not least, we believe that this project will work as a two-way knowledge channel. So it's not only Ukrainians learning from European experiences, but also Europeans learning from Ukrainians and also co-creation of something new that was not tested before. So what we will do during the project, I said that we were not building anything, but we will do research. We will write and create methodologies and recommendations. We will have workshops. We will have four main public conferences. The first one happened uh, like three weeks ago in Lviv. We will have the next one in Stockholm in spring and then in Vilnius in one year. And at the end of the project, 2026 April, we will have a conference probably in Kyiv. Together with uh, all those workshops, researches and so on, we will have CPD courses aimed at architectural professionals from Ukraine and educational program that would be adapted to the third year bachelor and implemented by Kharkiv Architecture School. We will have different activities and different topics in the project. So the principle is that each of the thematic areas will have at least one European partner and at least one Ukrainian partner. 
So in this way, we assure the co-creation of uh, Ukrainians and Europeans. And what are the topics? So the teams will work on these topics. Uh, heritage value assessment. These topics. Uh, this topic is led by Italian Chamber of Architects and National Union of Architects of Ukraine. Damage done by war assessment to the cultural heritage. This topic is also led by Italian Chamber and National Ukrainian Architects Union. Then we will have a topic regeneration of valuable heritage in a sustainable, economic, and culturally meaningful way. So this topic is led by us, Architects Association of Lithuania, but I think that this topic is overarching all the rest of the topics, so all the partners will be included in making the recommendations. Then we will have holistic renovation of Soviet housing in Ukraine. This is the topic that we are developing in Lithuania and talking about that for more than three years. So we will try to adapt and expand our own experience working together with Ukrainians. We will have a very interesting topic of participatory processes in heritage protection. Uh, and uh, we will have experiments of two shapes. One, it will be urban forums. Uh, urban forums will be organized by Roskvit and Estonian Union of Architects and workshops, healing through heritage restoration involving communities. So these workshops will be led by, again, Roskvit and Romanian Chamber of Architects. We will have a topic, architectural design competitions, implementation and financial tips. And this topic will be led by Austrian Chamber of Architects and also German architects together with National Union of Architects of Ukraine. We will have a practical topic of technologies and heritage. Uh, this topic will be led by Royal Danish Academy and National Union of Architects of Ukraine. And te with technologies, we will have two subtopics. One of them will be technologies that could be applied to the restoration of authentic heritage. And another one, we will try to explore the possibilities of creating new production lines in Ukraine so that uh, the cultural heritage restoration topic is not only about preservation of cultural heritage, but also about rising economy of Ukraine. And then, as I said, we will have very important topics, improvement of educational programs, uh, which is uh, the topic of Kharkiv Architecture School. And then uh, CPD program, CPD is Continuous Professional Development Program, which is led by Swedish Architects and National Union of Architects of Ukraine. So these are mainly the, the topics that we will cover during our project. At the end of the project, we will write a set of recommendations, but of course these recommendations will be not the only deliverables. We hope that the whole process will be will, and will serve as the main deliverable of the project. So what is next? Uh, we will issue open calls for participants very soon. We are now trying to organize among ourselves after the conference. So we will invite especially Ukrainian uh, experts and also everyone who would be interested to join specific working groups you had seen the topics, so if any topic is of your interest, you have some expertise, you have some idea that you would like to implement or you want just to get more specific knowledge and collaborate. So just wait for open calls and you will be able to apply for participation. So here I end my presentation and thank you very much. Looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Uta. Extremely uh, insightful and, and excited uh, of everything to come. So uh, it's it's uh, as you said, it's a, it's quite an ambitious uh, program, which uh, which is very good. I think I, I like that. Uh, what we plan to do this uh, this this evening, this roughly uh, total one and a half hour is indeed have a discussion and, and, and a debate uh, rather than, than more presentations. So this was a, a first introduction to the whole uh, program. Uh, we have been preparing uh, roughly four topics to, to talk about uh, that uh, all the speakers can, can react on, uh, so four different blocks. For uh, the attendees, if if you want to intervene or if you have a specific question within one of the blocks, uh, please put them in the Q and A 
or raise your hands so we can let you in because uh, definitely feel invited. It's not uh, that that everybody here on the screen likes to hear uh, herself talk all the time. So uh, please uh, ask your questions or comments or other ideas. Um, I would like to start actually with Katerina Koncharova because uh, you are not part of this project, as uh, we hope you will become uh, part of the project, but you are at the moment uh, a relatively outsider and, and hearing about this, we, we are curious uh, what your perspective is, what, what a project like this could bring for uh, Ukraine at, at this point in time. So maybe you can kick this off uh, with, with a short reaction to actually what you heard from Wouta. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm Katerina Gantara. What hadn't been mentioned is that uh, I currently work at World Monument Fund as Ukrainian cultural heritage specialist. And that gives me, allows me to, to speak about the value of, of this project from international perspective and from Ukrainian perspective as well, because we're professionally engaged in uh, safeguarding irreplaceable and protection of cultural heritage in a situation of crisis. It, it, it means also in the situation of ongoing war. And that's of course, uh, for me, creates part of the importance and significance and the value of this project because everyone speaks about post-war recovery, but very few institutions and projects targeting a current situation because we didn't, do not know when the war is over. And so we have to learn how to live in the situation of those dystopian scenarios that happen every day. So with those tactical steps that the, the project suggests, we envision strategical gigantic panorama and strategic picture of what should Ukraine look like and its heritage and heritage professional and infrastructure and institution should look like when the war is over. So it provides us a perfect field to test some uh, hypothesis, to test some of our ideas in this absolutely horrible situation, but still look forward for, for post-war recovery. For me, it's absolutely important because Ukrainians are also taking the lead in the project because it's very easy to pontificate from international perspective of how Ukrainians should behave. But you, Europe had never had an experience of ongoing war in such a gigantic scale. Europe had never hadn't had experience of herbicide after the world war ii like we are now having in herson in mikolaev in kharkiv and other cities that are almost that the attempt to erase those cities actually allows us to speak about the urban heritage and the importance of our habitat that is filthy rich with heritage sites for me it's also important because we're laying the foundation for partnership between absolutely different professionals, historic preservationists, cultural workers, architects, urban planners, to basically use this resource, this gigantic resource of cultural heritage of Ukraine, of our identity, as a, as a tool for revitalization, for community engagement, because people are returning to the place that they had to leave due to the safety issues, not because they're, um, they have some vision, but because they have a vision of home and they're returning home to the places that they love. And usually the places that they love is the street where they spend their childhood. And usually it's a somewhere in the center of the city, the fun time where they play with their, their grandparents or something like that. So it's all connected emotionally very tightly to who we are and to where we're returning. So from my perspective, and actually I met Ruta in Brussels during the work of Euro Commission group of experts on cultural heritage. And that served as a fantastic omen for to, to basically pave the foundation and pave the path to the future partnerships because this partnership between Ukraine and Europe Ukrainian professional institution and European professional institution also provides us with the voice, the vision, the opinion, and the common vision of Europe being of Ukraine being part of Europe and actually 
teaching Europe how to behave in the situation of the war because we, as we see, it's all just start spreading around. We all hope that that's gonna finish, but no one knows. So our experience, our Ukrainian experience is also valuable. And I'm really grateful for being here and being part of the project in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. You were exactly uh, uh, already touching uh, the, the, very much on the first topic that, that we wanted to address, uh, which is about assessing value and damage to the cultural heritage in Ukraine. So how to do that? And what are the specific challenges of the Ukrainian situation, uh, which already you pointed out, which is, is very specific, of course, for assessing the heritage damage and, and that value? How do you do it? What are the challenges? What are the practical implications? I mean, sometimes they're extremely practical on, on the monitoring and the assessment of it. Um, and does it help to prevent the destruction of heritage? And what can the international community do to more effectively try to prevent that, that destruction? Are there tools uh, that, that are in place that, that can be used? Or how to react to the facts of destruction, which have already happened? So what at this moment uh, could the international community do? And maybe also the bigger institutions like UNESCO, IRCOM, uh, what kind of methodologies do they have? Or what maybe kind of power do they have? So that I, I would first uh, shortly go back to you and then maybe uh, Ruth and, and Ruta could, uh, could add to that one. Well, thank you. Yeah, we'll be happy to share the updates on the project. Um, from the very early days of the war, the question of the a uh, cultural damage assessment and the uh, cultural heritage damage assessment was one of the key issues for World Monuments Fund. Earlier, again, in the early days of the war, the Ministry of Culture took the lead and ran the database of those historic sites and monuments of national local significance that were damaged or destroyed during this war. But, uh, uh, and there were like numbers of international institutions that were conducting the same database of damage site based on satellite images, open resources, analysis, and things like this. So everyone was doing it remotely, but no one, no professional architect had gone on the site to conduct the damage assessment and technical condition of the building assessment as it is required by U Ukrainian legislation. So WMF was absolutely delighted uh, in partnership with other international donor to donors to support damage assessment project led by NGO Tustan, now a heritage monitoring lab. Uh, please uh, visit their webpage heritage.in.ua where they are trying to update it as fast as possible, but again, it's not that easy. Uh, the experience that we had to analyze before uh, basically made us question what is the purpose of damage assessment? Because if it's a question of litigation and accountability, this is the completely, this is the one version of damage assessment because it requires special professionals and for example, in explosions and military actions, it's better to be someone educated on that kind of things. But if we want to conduct damage assessment for the purpose of restoration, strategizing what is the, the current need of, of a certain territory in terms of rest, restoration, renovation of lost architectural objects, this is a completely different thing. And this is why I'm so happy that I have a chance to talk to architects and historic preservationists and professionals who work on the ground. So we were sending expeditions on the ground. And since all the experience that Europe has for the moment is basically when the event and the danger is already gone. So it's like a blast in Beirut. It's like an earthquake in Italy. Not all it's all is safe. You can go to the location to conduct your damage and needs assessment. But now when the situation the war is still ongoing, our teams 
who go on the ground, our expeditions, multidisciplinary expeditions, has to be provided with bulletproof vest, with caskets, with a whole bunch of permissions from the military administrations, uh, usually also guided by military because it's not safe. And of course, after explosion of Kahokka Dam, the damage assessment became one of the most significant issues after all kind of um, the recent, for example, explosions in Chernigiv. It all was just super fantastically important for us to have a bigger picture what is actually going on. And the point is that this war in Ukraine was uh, catastrophic and actually made us rethink a lot of uh, greeds and a lot of approaches that we usually uh, had, but also it was a certain uh, point of pivotal point for international community, because basically the norms that had been developed that are, they're not working in the situation of ongoing war. Of course, we know about Geneva Protocol, uh, Geneva Convention and protocols, but they do not work. We know about blue shields and their recommendations, but it do not work. We all know that a lot of international institutions put a lot of efforts into pre-crisis preparation and post-war recovery, but there are uh, very, very few recommendations on how to behave in a situation of ongoing crisis. And those that exist put a lot of responsibility into offenders part. So in our case, Russian has to think that they're ruining uh, cultural heritage and try to avoid it with all costs, but it doesn't happen. Usually when, and again, early stages of the war, if you put a mark of a blue shield on the historic building, it used to serve as a target sign for Russian to basically shoot it. We've seen a lot of deliberate attacks on cultural heritage sites, and this is why we're trying to work as much as possible with local community also to figure out what are their needs. Because again, cultural heritage in many cases serves as a, as a switch to economic and social revival. Of course, communities are impacted by the war and sometimes it's really hard to initiate a dialogue because we see the world and and black and white. And it's sometimes absolutely impossible to listen to someone who has a different opinion. This is why community engagement start to be one of the very, very serious issues in those areas that were heavily affected by military actions. We also try to think about that as a certain um, very serious criteria in every decision-making process. But Again, using damage assessment for urgent stabilization is fantastically important. Uh, we're doing it all the time. We had a number of consultations in the early stages of the war. Should we wait until the war is over to start stabilization, restoration, reconstruction projects? Or should we start right away? The answer of the community was, yes, please start right away, because while we're waiting for the war to be over, the risk of losing what we already have is so much greater. Yes, there are some, some issues with safety and security, but they all can be mitigated or work in a, those areas that are relatively safe. But please do not hesitate. Take some actions right away. And this is why I'm... I'm using my moment of glory to basically invite architects and those who are engaged in historic preservation to apply for uh, World Monuments Fund uh, um, grant support. We're supporting projects in urgent stabilization of architectural sites that were damaged by military actions. So please take my contacts, contact me. I will answer all your questions. Thank you. Thanks. And, and in, in your answer, you also mentioned uh, <clears throat> a website where people could uh, look on. Could you put it in the chat, uh, maybe? Because I didn't quite understand it. And maybe, uh, Ruth, could you continue on, on this subject? Yes, with great pleasure. I'm happy uh, to continue on the subject. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to this discussion today. And um, let's say from the point of view of the Architects Council of Europe, uh, it was uh, really clear from the beginning uh, we were um, 
uh, supporting our Ukraine colleagues basically uh, one week after the war began. And um, I have to say thank you to Ruta Lettenaiten who really took on the task to further develop um, how can we support um, our Ukraine colleagues. We had a lot of ideas and uh, good intentions. And what was the biggest surprise in the first discussions were was basically was in the first meeting where our colleague uh, from the from Ukraine told us uh, they are already thinking about the reconstruction. This would not have been anything that I would have dared to think about. Uh, we were thinking of immediate help, how to support um, refugees, how to uh, support uh, colleagues looking for work, maybe in another country, uh, looking for um, uh, looking for a place to stay. These were our first initial ideas. Um, going through the whole process, then it became clear that um, we have quite a lot of ideas, but um, no funding. And uh, with this project, uh, we are now really in the possibility and with the lead of um, Ruta as the as a coordinator, main coordinator of the project to develop. And she explained and extend uh, what the project is aiming for uh, to support these ideas. And at this point, I want to just underline that the cultural heritage is an expression of cultural identity and is in, in, instinctively really linked um, to human rights. So that underlines the importance of cultural heritage. And cultural heritage is also protected under national uh, humanitarian law and the body of the law that applies specifically in situations of armed conflict. And just keeping that in mind, it really shows how important heritage is um, during uh, such crucial events um, like the war in um, the Ukraine. And um, the Architects Council of Europe sees the heritage as a great source for cultural recovery and also for the recreation of Ukraines and also their multicultural European um, identity. And therefore, um, we really want to support um, the development, especially of knowledge in capacity building, in heritage uh, value assessment methodologies to develop um, them together, to um, damage assessment. And Katarina also uh, named these points in depth. So if we if we come back maybe um, to the point of view, what um, might be also needed uh, in the sense of the rush of rebuilding and keeping in mind what the value of heritage is, I think a great responsibility lies there also in the hands, not only of the professionals, but also of the local and national government, because uh, on, on one side, it is really important um, to uh, work closely, that the ministries work closely together. And this was very clear on our discussion that we had in Lviv, that this is of utmost importance that ministries not only speak to each other, but really align and work closely on the topic together. Um, the second point which I consider important is the collaboration between, and we mentioned it, uh, but I want to emphasize it again, the collaboration between Ukraine architects um, and uh, European architects. But what also has to be very clear is that Ukraine architects have to be supported also on local um, level, so to strengthen the Ukraine architects in their own country. Then um, we also have to uh, take into consideration that um, public procurement and competitions will be um, put in place and therefore um, the right procedures have to be um, the, the right procedures have to be uh, developed so that um, at the end we have a quality-based 
um, decision process uh, concerning uh, competitions and public procurement. And another important point is also the sustainable criteria that um, should be quality orientated and um, be implemented also in the architectural design competitions. And this, for example, will be one element in the in the uh, UE Herit uh, project to develop these guidelines to develop together um, and uh, based on the need of um, our Ukraine colleagues to develop these ideas. And if we look at the possibilities that we have, let's say, um, concerning um, the um, re re uh, reconstruction of um, of uh, Ukraine, I think there are very, very big challenges um, ahead. Because uh, what is a challenge that uh, developments in this field should not go top down. It's really about bottom up to inspire a change in conceptual and operative approach. Um, it's also about the financial um, situation. So sudden um, financial support can uh, lead to a relief in a moment, but taking it into uh, a longer distance run uh, might not be enough. So let's say there should be also a concept of a gradual um, credit so that the money really goes to the people um, at the, at, um, at the, at the, uh, uh, level of execution and um, really proposing their different financial mechanism. I think that is important to think about. It's also important to discuss and think about how um, can uh, urban developments be uh, developed in the sense of, are we only thinking about layers like infrastructure, infrastructure water uh, distribution, energy supply, which might even then um, be, let's say, developed independently from each other or shouldn't we develop more the idea towards cells that are organic uh, constellations which then really uh, take into consideration the needs um, optimizes time, financial resources, workforce, and especially also develops the community bonds, which are really of utmost importance. And then um, are we discussing only about um, projects itself, or should we be also rethinking the processes in how to achieve the quality in, in the built environment? So um, I think at that point, a radical rethinking of the design system should be uh, in place and really the need also the very specific situation in the Ukraine. So this may be from my point of view. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I, I think it would be good to, to uh, open the, the question uh, that is in the Q&A now and, and maybe uh, from that follow up on, on the, subic, the second topic. So maybe Tatiana, could you voice uh, Vera's question? Thank you very much. We actually have a question which is a great challenge for the assessment of damages and destroyed heritage. The fact is that we do not have one register of um, uh, the list of monuments. We do not have them digitalized and we have everything on paper. How can we uh, actually resolve the issue uh, of assessment of ruinations and assessment of the heritage that we have? Um, and uh, this question can be addressed, I think, to Katerina and her foundation. Maybe this is the question to you, because you represent um, the Ukrainian situation with rosters, lists, and databases. Uh, I will be speaking on behalf of the whole team of the project, and this is very responsible. Uh, this is the very serious responsibility because basically the whole pro uh, this is why we have to launch in parallel, not only damage assessment, but also monitoring missions 
because yes, it's absolutely right. The registers of national local uh, heritage or newly fine heritage sites is something that you can all handle without a bottle of wine or something like this, because this is one of the critical, the most critical issues, but still they do exist. And if we're requested from the local authority, they will provide it. Uh, the other question is that a lot of historic sites or historically significant, artistically significant sites are not enlisted. And this also creates another challenge. This is why, again, I repeat myself, we launched a monitoring mission where every single blast or every single attack is tracked. And we also define the area of potential damage of, for example, an air bomb that can affect not only one, for example, historic building, but also area around. And where are those heritage sites or historically significant buildings that could be affected by this blast? Uh, we're doing that. And then when the team uh, goes on site with, with verification mission, it's not full uh, documentation, but it's only verification to find out is there is something to assess or there's everything's gone, there's absolutely nothing. So uh, when the verification missions come on site, they also run, uh, uh, cr investigate the area around to assess what is there. So we're conducting damage assessment, not only for those sites who are that are enlisted, but also to historic, uh, historic sites and the institutions of historic or cultural significance. Like for example, uh, I don't know, the theater in Zaporizhia or other sites that are Bauhaus uh, would find fantastically beautiful constructionist uh, avant-garde buildings, but they are not enlisted into any of the registers, but they are still significant, notorious, and we would like definitely to take care or consider any stabilization of this fantastic urban and architectural landscape. Um, this is, I think this is the answer to your question. So we're considering all historic buildings, not only those that are in the registers, but, and if you would like to know what buildings are on the registers, you just have to uh, request that list uh, from the uh, local administration, meaning the regional administration, because for now it works absolutely fantastic if you work with partners on the site. Thank you. Тут уже неодноразово попередніх репліках. In the previous uh, comments, we have heard the question um, and the issue of importance of local communities uh, and their role in working with uh, heritage objects uh, and those objects that were ruined as a result of the war. So this is one of the key questions um, both in international practice and in uh, local practice. And I think that participatory approach is one of the cornerstones of uh, heritage management, both in Europe and it should become so in Ukraine. So I believe that the issue of participation practices is one of the key cornerstones of the Yuri Herit project too. And the speakers are asked now to answer the question, or rather maybe it is a topic for reflection. Uh, today in Ukraine, we have a lot of towns, townships, which were erased uh, from the face of the earth. And so do we need to uh, re reconstruct, rebuild actually, the objects uh, of heritage if the community is gone, if uh, there are no residents left, if the social dynamics between them has changed, if there is no community there anymore, or maybe the Hermada says we do not need this kind of Soviet-based heritage. So, do we need to contribute our efforts to preserve such kind of monuments? Who should do this? Who is to decide whether this uh, heritage has the local meaning local importance or is it globally important? Another issue here is how we are dealing with uh, heritage recovery uh, in terms of the authenticity. For instance, if the Hromada wants to rebuild uh, from scratch uh, a ruined object, uh, the object will not be the same, but it is important for the people. And then 
Though it is not authentic, it is of great importance. And this is one of the uh, really important concepts uh, in working with heritage. So what could be the um, approaches to such a situation? This is an open question. I can see, Ruth, you have, uh, you want to take the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you, Tatiana, for um, addressing this. I, as you underlined, I think the um, civil society and the communities are um, the of ut utmost importance in in this process. And um, therefore, um, I and this is something a question addressed uh, to to you uh, from the Ukraine. Maybe I'm wrong, but I understood that. Um, even uh, let's say in cities where the damage um, has been really high, um, there is a will of the people to return to their own city. So I expect that at a certain point, um, uh, the citizens will return. So there will be maybe a community maybe shaped a bit different, but um, there is a willingness to return to their um, home city. And, um, and this discussion that you just triggered is, I think, one of the most important also architectural discussions um, that we have, not only um, in connection with Ukraine, but in, in, in general, how to reconstruct something that has been completely erased. And I think there are, um, let's say, out of the observations in the discussions, there are different uh, methods how to approach it no, we and maybe I would just put into let's say four ideas one idea is to construct it as it was where it was um, that is one option a uh, second option is to continue the existing tradition so maybe there are all still existing um, uh, structures and adding new structures in the same urban pattern that would be a second possibility a third possibility uh, where a great loss um, might lead to new urban patterns um, but let's say the uh, reconstruction then with similar structures picking up traditions that have existed um, in this area and a fourth option is the programmatic approach where um, let's say nothing exists and there is a new urban pattern with new structures so um, I think this is maybe the range of discussion where you can enter um, into it and it is, um, I think, really directly addressed to the need of the population of the people which live there. And I think therefore also the um, top-down approach is not really suitable. It's really about the bottom-up approach to analyze and not only taking into consideration a whole area, maybe little, um, and therefore I spoke about um, the idea of uh, not thinking in layers, in big layers, but really in organic uh, constellations where uh, you can address the need more directly and um, not in such a huge, um, vast um, uh, connection. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, you have, uh, you I will, I will try to be brief, as, as Ruth said a lot. So you are asking, should uh, Ukraine rebuild cultural heritage if there is no society? So, uh, well, you have to say whether you want to rebuild it or not, because who are we to say what you should do? But as we understand, uh, well, the cities were created, you know, as uh, they started as marketplaces, but I think that in situation that is right now in Ukraine, it's the cultural heritage that could be and should be the starting point of rebuilding, as it has that, that seed of identity, of locality and of belonging. So just as an example, in our project, we will have a, a workshop healing through restoration of heritage that will be led by Roskit and Romanian Chamber of Architects. So during those workshops, the architects would invite certain societies, certain communities to put yeah. their hands directly on a piece of cultural heritage and to work in order to preserve it. But it's not only the piece of cultural heritage that would be preserved. The main target is the psychology and the 
uh, psychological well-being of the community because taking part in restoration of cultural heritage they heal themselves and they build bonds between them so this is kind of it's not only architectural experiment it will be also a psychological one thank you Так, Катерину, власне, хочу передати теж вам слово із уточнюючим... Катерина, you have the floor, and I would like to ask one more question. Here, you have already shared, Катерина, that you have a great experience in field trips to um, send them to places which were seriously damaged. How can we, in your opinion, cooperate with the local communities? especially the communities who are very close to the front line. And so what are the priorities um, for your team when the priority of those people are to survive? Maybe it is not time for them yet to think about heritage. They need to think about survival. But you said that we need to start working with heritage now so that we could, could have them uh, protected. So what will be your comment to this challenge? How can we include such uh, communities along the front line? Thank you. This is a very serious question because uh, from our perspective, there is a very serious ethical question if we should approach a local community ask, asking them to uh, articulate their request for cultural heritage protection or cultural heritage preservation. Of course, it's very uneasy when you have to take care about water supplies, basic safety. If your kids go to school and will return safely home, uh, usually people, of course, they have to cover and take care about basic needs and only then about culture. This is absolutely fine. But we're providing assistance and again in articulating this request they the local community already has if there is no need for the local community to stabilize the damaged cultural sites of course no one gonna do that because every well every heritage site every heritage monument has it varies certain values uh, like we're putting our thoughts into words it's like values that are put in buildings and sites. So if there is no one to carry those values uh, from past to the future, there will be no one to assist to, and there will be no resources to fund those efforts. So we basically need to listen to what the local community says. And if following this previous discussion on if there is no community, what should we do? The point is that the history in Ukraine repeats itself, that's number one, and history in Ukraine is something that is happening right now. So every side has a historic value, for example, permanent value grants. And if we talk about history, like uh, um, Professor Ola Hrybczynski one mentioned that we're fighting for the same territories at the same fortresses like Bakhmut as we uh, right now as we did 300 years ago and that's completely right he is absolutely right with that so there are some points there are some territories some historic sites uh that turned into uh, urban units that were now that keep this continuity that continue this this value this history and this is completely the same so I would say that there is no such thing as the absent community, there, like no community. There is a question of continuity of certain values. And if the site still keeps the value, they will be community to pick it up and carry into the future. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. And I see, uh, Ruta, you have a comment here, maybe? Is yes, that... Anna, if you allow me, I will slightly change that very, very painful topic of communities that are now in the war and go back to your previous question on how to engage communities and what can they do while uh, treating the cultural heritage. So I've just got very, very fresh news of a new book. So I will just share it on my screen and maybe you will find it useful. 
this is a book uh, issued by Utropian, and this is a book about community-driven adaptive reuse in Europe, best practice related with cultural heritage. So probably we don't have to invent a bicycle. The book is there. I'm stopping sharing my screen. I will share the link in the chat so we can look up in the book. Thanks, great. <clears throat> yeah, 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 we already noticed that uh, we uh, tried already to put too much topics into uh, into one and a half hour of discussion. So uh, we, we will move in on to our, our third topic. Uh, also, because uh, one of the uh, attendees actually asked a question about that, it's uh, in, I think, every uh, uh, conference or talk that we had uh, so far about reconstruction or rebuilding Ukraine, it is about uh, the, the reconstruction of the, the, the modernistic heritage of the Soviet housing buildings, the modernistic architecture, how to deal with that. Uh, it's it's a, a kind of hot potato discussion, of course, uh, like how to, to, to deal with that and how to handle that. And, and I would like to ask the question, first of all, to Ruta, because you in Lithuania have a lot of experience there and, and is there something that, that can be learned from what you saw and what you did in, in Lithuania? Okay, so I understand this question as a twofold question. Are we talking about modernism architecture or are we talking about Soviet blocks? Because although Soviet blocks mass housing was built during the modernist architectural period in post-Soviet countries and also in Ukraine, uh, when talking about architectural quality, very few of those houses or, or micro rayons can talk about uh, having architectural value. But when it comes to modernist architecture, we have so many gems. And I know that in Ukraine, you have even more of them so uh, I, I would say this is too broad topic to answer in five minutes. Well, in short, definitely, yes, modernist architecture is of value and it's also a part of, uh, of the history and also some of those pieces, they have really very high artistic value and it has to be uh, preserved. But now when it comes to the Soviet housing, which is the topic that we... Uh, engage are engaged into while the project you inherit i usually get that question what does soviet housing has to do with the heritage with cultural heritage does it have any cultural value why you are including this topic into your inherit program so uh, my answer is that we don't know yet we have to explore it during the project but we suspect that there is certain value and this value could be also multi-layered. So first is of course the artistic value that we are, well, as architects, we, this is the thing that we are thinking the first, what is the artistic value? So some of these quarters, they are built according very specific urban idea also sometimes architectural idea not all of them but some of them they are already artistic uh, creations and we just have to explore that artistic value but it's not only that a uh, big part of citizens they live in these kinds of blocks of flats so big part of urban culture was flourishing there and this is part of our history. So how can we, maybe not to preserve it, not everything, but how could we keep the memory because it's a part of our identity and how could we uh, save that memory while getting our home better, making it better? This is also a question because we have certain traditions, certain culture of communication in those areas. 
and not everything that is going on there is bad. I mean, it's not only vandalism and, uh, you know, danger when you go outside, but it's also conversations, games, picnics, and everything else that is happening there. And also the value lies in the very big mass. So if we are talking about sustainable rebuilding, then we have to think on how to use that stock that we have. And unfortunately, the, this, this housing, at least in our part of Europe, is really in a bad condition during various reasons. In Soviet time, we had no uh, good constructors. Every uh, construction material was you no know, half stolen. So they were built in clay and sand. And now they are falling apart and energy efficiency is really horrible but somehow it can be improved. And also what I have to say that during our initiative, what uh, we are trying to preach is that uh, when talking about this huge, huge stock of housing and very big challenge of renovation, I know that it's expensive and it's slow, but uh, a state cannot think only about energy efficiency because it will be just you know, money put into insulation without any improvement of quality. What we want is to bring a quality to those Soviet housing. So the quality lies in much more than only insulation and smaller bills for, for electricity. It's about public life. It's about public spaces outside and also inside. It's also about improvement of your individual space, which is your flat also improvement of connections, mobility in the area, improvement of the life that you are having together with your communities and your neighbors. And the lifestyle that probably could change from being just, you know, uh, like normal that we had 50 years ago to a sustainable and really engaging uh, living together. So these are, you know, main topics that we are addressing and, and we hope to address uh, during this project. And we really hope to find the value of uh, certain modernistic housing in Ukraine. I am sure that you have something that we don't know yet, and I'm really eager to explore it. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and I think there are actually many examples and many studies because the, the problem is, is, is uh, white also in terms of what you mentioned, the energy efficiency uh, and, and the state of, of what the buildings are in. I, I know also there are a lot of studies from Poland uh, who, who might uh, be able to help in that. Is, is that something, Katerina, you, you also encounter and, and see um, as, as something to, to work on? Or do you recognize it uh, also as a difficult topic in, in terms of do you want to keep these buildings in the first place? Or what do you notice that, how do people react to that, inhabitants? This is kind of in a way a uh, funny question because uh, on February 23rd, uh, before the war, day before the war, we had a workshop uh, with the Cherkasy Urban Institute on um, micro rayons and it turns like out that uh, every micro rayon has a very de developed network of communities and people recognize the boundaries of what they have and they would like to uh, to have a special signage of their territory so there is a, a way to articulate not historic values but community social and economic values in every micro rayon on the other hand from the donor's perspective residential buildings and especially privately owned residential buildings is something very complex for example in mykolaiv there are not that many sig sig signatory projects that could be implemented but the main scope of damage falls into private residential buildings and you had ever been to mykolaiv the whole urban landscape and the whole tissue of the city is sown from this tiny little private houses. So there is a request or um, there is a need for a municipal government to develop a certain project, how to provide assistance to private owners who basically actually own historic buildings 
to conduct professional restoration of at least facades of those buildings because not a single donor would like to support this kind of gigantic urban renovation uh, project, but there is a way to fundraise, to engage a lot of international efforts into urban revitalization, if we talk about that. On the other hand, the, the Soviet heritage is also something that had been targeted. Talking about the regional administration building in Kharkiv, talking about uh, uh, drama theater in Chernihiv from the very early stages of the war. This is also something that is suffering and is being wounded in the, during this war. And of course, I, I don't want to talk about the brother, but yes, that's right. Uta? Yeah, just a reaction and maybe a question to my Ukrainian colleagues that are there on the panel. Uh, I am coming from a post-Soviet country, which is Lithuania, and we have a very, um, I would say, sensitive approach to our Soviet past, which is kind of negative. So one of the problems of uh, Soviet housing and also modernist architecture is that people associated with the with the regime that was making them suffer. So I also get that question when I'm talking with Europeans that about this project in Ukraine, they are saying, but how can you talk about modernist heritage if this is something that was built by Russians, then probably this society doesn't want to have anything of that heritage on the ground. So probably what you are doing is in vain because all they would want to do is to demolish everything. So I know that it sounds provocative and I have my own answer, but I would like to ask maybe Katerina to reply. Well, first of all, almost all uh, monuments of that era were developed and designed by Ukrainian architects. Uh, even Khrushchev uh, Street in Kiev, there is a fantastic book uh, devoted to this street. Um, Natalia Kondel Pirminova wrote this fantastic essay, uh, research on who are those Ukrainians who developed that Soviet street in the very core of Kiev, and then uh, of course everyone is get their personal connection to the sites that are being so-called Soviet. So for local community, it's more about their private memories than something that is overwhelmingly totalitaristic. Uh, of course, we have this narrative as well, uh, um, anti-communization and everything that is related to Soviet times and everything that is related to Russian empire needs to be erased, but somehow it didn't touch that much architectural sites. Um, on the other perspective, of course, but again, there are so many urban developments, so many urban planning structures, so many architectural sites that were created. And when we talk, for example, about modernism, uh, this is the heritage that attracted a lot of attention, for example, a decade ago. When we talk about Kvity Ukraini, when we talk about this, um, um, the anti-NTI building on Libitska in Kiev, this all served as a certain attraction to the professional community to take care about them to take care about this brutalism, modernism building. And of course, I have to give credits to urban cur curators who actually invested a lot on, on this. I can talk the fantastic words about Zhenya Gubkina from Kharkiv and her team um, to do that. So modernists, modernistke, uh, that was the name of her project as well. So there were a lot of initiatives because basically if the site doesn't have this load of of of, of uh, uh, being listed as national local heritage is basically unbound to the hands of a local community to take part in its preservation to take part in this protection so this is why the 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 fight against modernism actually launched this gigantic avalanche of uh, public activists if we talk about cultural heritage so that 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 serves in a very various way Thank you, thank you. 
Uh, let's move on to our last uh, block uh, and, and hopefully leave some more time for the audience to ask some questions. So maybe Tatiana, you can start off with that discussion. Uh, Thank you very much, Lilette. And the last question on my list, or rather a block of questions, which we would like to um, to put to you today this is education and uh, empowerment um, in connection to uh, ukrainian architects empowerment that could be uh, supported by the european community because despite all the tragic uh, events that were ignited by uh, russian aggression on ukraine uh, we can see uh, it enabled us to see the examples of solidarity and the uh, the network of uh, professionals um, all sorts of twin city support etc and the project you inherit is an excellent example of this so my question would be how ukrainian architects and uh, specialists on heritage how can they uh, join international professional networks how can they use available international resources and what are the challenges that uh ukrainian education system is facing and has to overcome to get integrated into the uh international community so please uh give short answers uh who would like to start Okay, let us start with Ruth uh, Shagiman, who is the head of the largest network uh, presented today. Yes, um, well, first of all, uh, one option is to participate as members and um, the Architects Council of Europe is really happy uh, to have um, the European Architectural um, as, uh, Union as a member of the Architects Council. So this is, uh, let's say, already one opportunity that exists. So um, let's say the Ukraine delegation has the possibility to then participate in the discussions uh, concerning education because we have work groups uh, we have um, uh, conferences, uh, for example, on education, on public procurement, um, on energy uh, laws, um, etc. So uh, all the topics that are of, of interest for the European architects are covered by uh, different work groups. And well, it's open for participation throughout the um, de delegations and delegated uh, who can contribute and vice versa. Um, it is a big option also um, for us to learn from the Ukraine colleagues there. Um, this is one big possibility. Then um, if we discuss about, or if we speak about education, it's not only about educating the profession, it's also about educating um, the civil servants. Um, it's about educating administration so that um, those people who implement then um, the different ideas are also aware and sensitized uh, into um, the right uh, direction, let's say so. Uh, this is, I think, uh, another important point. And um, the third important point is about alignment of regulations and uh, legislation. And I think this is a process that we can also start in the Architects Council of Europe, also um, in parts in the UE Herod project, just as an example about competitions, not to align um, the regulations on competitions uh, depending on the needs um, in the Ukraine, for example, or then also the alignment uh, between um, the public procurement, the European public procurement um, directive, um, how to further develop it also uh, together with our Ukraine colleagues. Um, or also um, in Europe, we have the professional qualification directive. All these words are really long and very technical, but let's say the basic idea um, behind the professional qualification directive is that we in Europe recognize under certain 
circumstances, the qualifications as equal. So um, that, uh, let's say, for example, a German architect can automatically then be recognized in Spain or France and um, um, be mobile in, in Europe. And this would then also um, be something that uh, could be uh, discussed together with um, our Ukraine colleagues, um, especially as we have already experienced also um, towards alignment with third countries, not with Canada, etc. So um, we know how to develop together, um, let's say, a common understanding under which circumstances would we recognize our professional qualifications. This would be, yes, maybe a third point um, to work together. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Ruta, you have the floor. Thank you, Tanya. My intervention will be not that general as rules, but I will just uh, make some reminder of the of the project's boundaries. So uh, inside the project, we will have two activities that are related with the professional education. Of course, the workshop with communities, they would also serve as educational tool. But what I wanted to mention and to stress here that we will have two activities for professionals. First one is the CPD courses where the architects can apply. I, I think that we are talking about 24, 25 architects from Ukraine, not only architects, also heritage specialists, uh, art historians and so on, uh, that would be selected for those courses. And then uh, we will have an educational program that will be tested, created and tested by Kharkiv Architecture School. The topic will be exactly reconstruction and recovery of cultural heritage as a resource for sustainable redevelopment of the country. So this program will be tested in 2025. And we hope that at the end of the project, when it proves to be really relevant and successful, we could talk and advise Ukrainian government to make it accessible and adapted to all the architectural schools in Ukraine so that it doesn't stay only in one architectural school. Because while listening to your uh, debates among Ukrainian professors and Ukrainian architects, uh, we got the idea that the education of cultural heritage specialists, architects, is not perfect in Ukraine and you need certain improvement and knowledge. So hopefully this project provides you with a chance to create really good program for that. So as to mention, I know that the ambition for the project is very big, but also we have to understand that it's only two years and a half, it's only 1 million euros. It sounds really great, 1 million, but when you divide it into three years and 12 partners, then it's not that much. So I would see it as a pilot project for something even bigger. So if we create the bonds between the organizations, between the individuals that are part of this project, I hope that it creates somehow like a snowball effect in the field of education as well. Probably the professors who would somehow follow the program they would uh, be infected by those thoughts and then, then going to their own universities, they will rethink their own programs and they will uh, improve them to make cultural heritage as you know part of, of their curricular. And then uh, just my, my last remark, I was thinking about, you know, you are talking about education. I was thinking about uh, what, what uh, will be those people that uh, we will educate and what will be those people that will go to CPD courses. So it seems to me that in the future, in the very near future, you will have a great army of women architects rebuilding Ukraine. I guess that these these people will be our audience and then maybe for the next generation we will get uh, men and boys on board as well thank you very much uh, ruta ruth thank you for your um, comments recommendations uh, catherine do you have any comments to share your educational experience, which you have gained both in Ukraine and, and abroad. 
very shortly, please, because uh, we are uh, reaching the limit of our today's uh, seminar, I guess. Mm. Well, first of all, my interest to the United States laid basically on my interest in their historic preservation educational programs, because we do not have anything like this in Ukraine that would provide holistic approach to to the way you treat cultural heritage, the way you treat historic communities, to the way you treat urban heritage and urban infrastructure. And therefore, uh, it was absolutely important for me to to find the tools that can assist Ukraine in their community engagement. And the fact that Ukraine lacks resources for historic preservation that is insanely expensive. So we have to rely not only on professional circles, but also on the community on the ground to seek and, and possess the resources that we may need. This is why partner public-private partnership is really important. This is why there are a bazillion of other tools like tax easements and things like that that do not exist in Ukraine. We basically, in Ukraine, we basically force people to love heritage. That is, of course, doesn't work. But if you encourage them to express their uh, love and affection with memory and historic sites, it's, of course, more appealing and more productive and constructive and effective in a way. So basically, when we talk about historic preservation education in Ukraine right now, of course, this is where this uh, this the you reherit project has no competitors because as for previously before the war, there were at least six educational project programs that used to teach historic preservation, but now there's only one or two that still are operating and still remain and provide educational services. This is why we can, in five years or even less, we may end up having thousands of historic sites in need of stabilization or, or protection of preservation, but no experts on the ground who can provide those kind of services. This is why the situation is critical. And this is why I'm really grateful to Ruta and the whole team to arrange this project and to share educational efforts and capacity buildings. I, I think <laughs> the channel is waiting for me to uh, to take the floor. Um, yeah, it's 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 true. It's uh, two minutes before uh, we were uh, supposed to to close off, and I think we should do that and and not go way over time. It it never works. It's better to to close uh, when everybody is still wanting to talk more and to hear more than uh, than the other way around. Uh, I, I think uh, this proves already that it's very good that this is a series and not just a one-off because there is so much more to talk about. Uh, this is such an extremely relevant uh, topic. Uh, I, I would uh, like to also uh, address uh, Vera Janchuk in, in the, in the Q&A and also in the chat, uh, who was actually... Uh, offering support, if I read this very well. So I would like to ask Ruta, could you please, uh, again in the chat, uh, mention a contact person uh, for this uh, whole project? I think it's it might be relevant for, for lots of people uh, who are there uh, and will be later then also uh, in, in the YouTube channel uh, where people can, can reach us. Um, I want just to to close off with uh, thanking you all thank you very much for being here but uh, as katarina already said for uh starting this whole project and uh and and yeah being there uh in in uh, promoting uh, this this relevant topic katarina thank you very much for for your uh reaction uh, uh to it and uh yeah, like I said in the beginning, we very much hope you will stay uh, involved and, and uh, work with it and that this community could grow indeed with uh, whatever men or women are, uh, are feeling uh, engaged to do so. So 
thank you very much again. Stay tuned to next lectures in this series, but also on other topics. Uh, we just uh, this week launched our first newsletter, which is a very good tool to stay uh, up to date. So uh, please look at the Rosfit website to uh, to uh, subscribe to that newsletter and stay tuned on news from different projects, but also uh, on lectures and events that are relevant to uh, to our topics. So thank you very much for being here, also all the attendees, and uh, hope to see you soon next time.